Hi guys, welcome to the Perform Happy Podcast. We have a very special guest today. We have Miss Shannon Evans, who is also known as the Scholar Coach, among other amazing titles like Masters in Education, uh, over 17 years of, of coaching experience, as well as an admissions counselor for multiple colleges, including University of Maryland, University of Oklahoma, Mississippi State University, East Mississippi Community College, Utica College. She's coached little teenies all the way up through the college level. So she is essentially an expert on college recruiting for athletes, which is something that I get I get talked to about a lot, you know, from kids as young as 10 years old who go, I want to compete in gymnastics for Oklahoma. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't, I had no concept of college at age 9, 10, 11, 12. But today it's, it's like you need a sport to get even into college, but then how do you get yourself into the college you want with the, you know, the financial situation that works for your parents. So we're going to, I'm going to be picking Shannon's brain today to hopefully uh, learn a little bit myself and allow you guys to learn a little bit about how to set your kid up for success in college, or if you're the athlete, what you can be doing at different ages along the way to set yourself up for success. So welcome, Shannon. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for having me as your guest. I'm really excited to be here and I've read tons about you and your, the work you do. And I'm really kind of excited to have someone kind of in my world to, to talk to, because it's kind of exciting. It is. I love nerding out when I find someone who, you know, (laughs) who likes to talk about (laughs) mindset for success and adolescent athletes. I'm like, me too. No Yeah, mindset tools and oh my God, (laughs) content for children. Yeah, I know. It's it's fun. And it comes for, at least for me, and I'm, I'm guessing from you that it comes from this place of what we do seems like we're just, you know, helping these athletes through four years of their lives or, or eight or but it's life skills. It's yeah. we, we are changing the trajectory of people's lives for the better if we're doing our jobs well. Exactly. And that's kind of how I shifted, why, part of why I shifted out of the classroom and out of admissions, um, besides moving, <laughs> um, was because what I saw was that, you know, with the advent of, of the internet, we no longer have a state college that has, let's, let's just say they have 900 seats for freshmen, incoming freshmen. They are now having um, sometimes 10, sometimes 20, depends on the college, thousand qualified applicants Mm -hmm. applying for those 900 seats. And so what I decided was kids need to learn how to network Mm -hmm. and how to position themselves and how to communicate and how to make better decisions before they start the college search so that, and I always like the so that phrase, so that they can get into the best college for them with the best financial package possible. Sounds great. And it's really critical because if they can't get past the gatekeepers who are the admission staff, who literally sit down with all these stacks and stacks and stacks of applications sitting around the table. And then they have to open each and every one of them. They hand read every one of those essays. Mm. And so everybody in that whole stack, those 20,000 applicants are all just as highly qualified as you are. So how do you stand out? And that was when I went, whoa, something has to change. We can't change the system and we're not gonna change the number of applicants. Yeah. So what can, what What can can we we change? Yes. What can we do? Yeah. And so that's how my business actually got started. And now, and so what do you do? What, what services do you currently provide for families? Okay. I help, I help primarily athletes and I work with, I work with lots of young female athletes because they seem to be the most underserved population in the recruiting process that there are not as many support mechanisms in place. And what I do is I coach them through the process. And I usually start with them when they're sophomores in high school or early in their junior year, because later than that is honestly too late. You can't wait till your senior year. And I not only coach them, I end up coaching their parents as well. And then I have to kind of help 
their guidance counselor at school by teaching the kid the right questions to go in and ask and the right services to kind of sometimes have to demand. And I teach them how to advocate for themselves, the students. I teach the parents how to stop over parenting and let some things transpire so that growth can happen so that their child is resilient and can have better success, not only in the recruiting process and deal with the heartbreak of some people will like you, some people won't. Sometimes you're just not the fit that they're looking for in their team. And then helping them to navigate what that looks like and other opportunities and kind of opening their eyes to what's possible. And then oftentimes there's some really difficult conversations I have to have with parents about what schools or kids can afford to apply to. And often they think the really expensive schools are the ones that they can't apply to. And the really expensive state schools are the ones they should apply to when often it's not the truth. So uh, wonderful. So I have so many questions for you. I would love to kind of start with um, the younger end of the spectrum and Mm -hmm. what can parents do now, now that they've got, you know, maybe a a highly talented 10, 11, 12 year old gymnast in a sport like, um, like gymnastics or like swimming or where, where college is in sight, but they're going to have to be, you know, fairly exceptional. What can these parents be doing now that set them up for that resilience that will that will allow them to kind of fly gracefully through this recruiting process? Well, starting early, letting them fail, which is really hard as a parent, um, not to live through their parent. And a lot of people go, I don't live through my kid. And then I start asking them questions. And, you know, there's so much pressure in American culture that are we as parents kind of bind our children's um, actions or inactions into who we are and our identity. And that's really unhealthy. And so um, it really undermines the autonomy and the competency of those children when they have such high expectations they have to meet. I'll give you an example. I tell parents, and this is a very difficult conversation, by the way, they don't like this. I tell parents I, when, when they say something to the effect of, well, you know, my child, my child's known since they were 10 years old that they were going to play basketball and I'll go, your child's five, four, where are they going to play basketball and for whom? And they'll go, well, my kid's going to play for UCLA. And I'll go, when was the last time they had a five foot four person? Well, they'll grow in college and I'll go, okay, let's look at reality. And then it comes down to the parents go, but Everybody knows my kid's going to go. I'm like, no, you've said this. Now you've set your kid up for a really high expectation. And now you're living vicariously through your child. So let's reverse this. I said, is your child. Well, I'm going to back out a little. You have a parent and, and usually their parents are in their 70s or 80s. And I'll go, okay. Are you responsible for your parents' self-esteem? Are you responsible for your 80-year-old mother's personal and professional image of themselves? Well, no, of course not. Then why are you making your 12-year-old responsible for your self-esteem and your parenting persona and you're in your 40s? And they kind of go, ouch. They don't like it because it makes them look at themselves. They often deny it, but they'll usually come back and go, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I'll own it. I mean, I got a three-year-old who I'm constantly like, okay, don't make me look bad. I'm supposed to be yeah, accepting this. In- I'm supposed to be unruffled right now. Uh, how, how, do, how do I proceed? Let them picture fit in Walmart and see how you act. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then how you feel. Yeah. So it's time to put a check on those things. So when we start... I mean, it's hard to start when they're in high school to start thinking about it that way. But once you do and you step back, it's amazing what a shift that creates. It creates a shift for you and it creates a shift for your child. One of the things I often tell parents to do is one-on-one with their child, ask them, 
how can I be a better parent to you? And you give them a little bit of parameters, you know, but if you listen to it, a lot of times they're, they will tell you things that you already knew, or they'll tell you, you know, I think you do a great job at X. And sometimes they'll go, well, you know, mom, I really wish when you're on the sidelines, you wouldn't coach me. And that's hard to hear. Mm -hmm. And you kind of got to go ouch and go, okay, got it. Why? Well, because you confused me or you upset me or you embarrassed me or you, okay. That's they're entitled to those opinions and that's what they are. You can weigh them out. But if you continue to have these conversations in a safe space, you'll get feedback and it will honestly create such a great opportunity to grow as a parent and in your communication and your, because you're going to teach them coping strategies and communication strategies by creating that moment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, have I will. A, oh yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I will say that off, you know, your very few first couple of times you'll ask, oh, I don't know. That's a favorite kid question. But if you keep asking this question at different times in different ways in a safe moment, you know, don't do it right after a game because everybody's emotions are up. Yes. You know, do it when you're in the car running an errand or, those five minutes you're, you've just finished watching a movie and there's a terrible commercial on nobody's paying attention to. Yep. One great uh, game that I like to play whenever I have both the parent and the athlete on a session together, we play keep, stop, start, which is where you ask the, ask the kid, what's one thing mom can keep doing that she's, that she's doing well, mom, dad, you know, whoever, Yeah. Uh, what can they stop doing that's not useful or helpful and what would you like for them to start doing? Oh, I like that. And that it's a nice, it's just a nice little formula. And you know, and you can you can even pitch it at your younger kid, like let's play, let's play the game, keep stop start, and kind of check in periodically. I love how you mentioned checking in periodically on it because as they get used to it, they may have more substance. You know, half the time they're like, I think I'm going to answer these questions wrong and get in trouble. So I'm just going to say, you're perfect, mom. <laughs> But. Yeah. Well, it, it starts giving them those conversation strategies, which will actually serve them in college with roommates, with professors, with coaches, with people they run into, sororities, fraternities, whatever. Yeah. It, you know, we, we, we would love to have our children live in a cocoon and in a perfect world. But when we micro-organize or over-organize or over-involved in their lives, there's no space for life to happen. And when we don't create that space for life to happen, they don't get to learn the lessons that happen in those spaces. And so, you know, that's where those lessons happen that actually give our kids grit. And so when you create these conversations and you create these opportunities and you back off, they start to actually develop the grit that they need, the tenacity they need to be successful adults. I mean, the whole game, game of this is not just to get them a scholarship to play college sports. We're, we're supposed to be raising them to have life skills. Yep. I, I will never forget the reaction I got from a mom, a swim mom, when she said, you know, well, I have to remind him to bring his goggles or he'll forget his goggles. And I was like, let him swim without them. Yes. Let him show up without goggles and see what happens. And then He'll quit forgetting. Exactly. <laughs> but she looked at me like, what? I mean, that whole well, the idea yeah. of let them fail, it feels almost like biologically wrong to let mm -hmm. your child fail. It's something you could so easily fix for them. But that so what tips do you have for parents who maybe particularly struggle with that? Whoa. Well. First, they have to self-identify. We've all micromanaged at one time or we've all, but you know, it is that thing of, I, honest to goodness, my kids were swimmers too. And they played lacrosse and hockey and everything else. We had, you know, we, my car never smelled good. <laughs> you know, I had, I had two boys and a girl, and then I had a couple of other boys that lived with us at different times. Um, so um, I, I'm not one to go deliver lunch to them. Mm -hmm. You forget your lunch, dude, I'm at work. Good luck. Bum from a friend, eat an apple from the pile at the, you know, the lunch counter 
or I guess you'll be hungry for dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. We kept swim goggles on every doorknob in the house, I swear. (laughs) (laughs) If you forgot one, that was your own doings, because I I can guarantee you going out the door, there were probably at least three or four hooked to the door. It's it's a standing joke at any swimmer's house. Um, My son was in high school. There must have been a collection of them on his um, uh, rearview mirror. (laughs) Because he learned. So he learned. <laughs> he probably he forgot him once. <laughs> and, you know, my 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 boys would always forget mouthpieces and whatnot. And so got to where they, they would put on the grocery list, buy 10, you know, order a box of mouthpieces. And they just dumped them in their bags. And they knew they'd lose them or forget them or stick them in their helmet and go, you know, and lose them in, in transit somewhere. So thank God for the ones that finally came out that were that would tie to your helmet, the tethered ones. <laughs> it saved you some so, some grocery so shopping. Yeah. Because if you can't forget your helmet, you know, so you can't play without the helmet. So your mouth guard was always on your helmet. So, you know, there were there are always trips, tips and tricks that you can teach your kid. But the greatest gift you can teach your kid is, oh, well, I guess you didn't bring your leotard. You can sit on the sidelines at that meet. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. You screwed up. Not me. I'm your mom, not your maid. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then they get a lesson. And that's, yeah, that's one of my big teaching points is that, yeah, you, you must fail. It's part of the deal. And if you, and and if you're afraid of it, or if you're afraid of that rejection, which so many of these high achieving, high talent athletes, they are used to succeeding, succeeding, Mm -hmm. succeeding, succeeding. And then they hit a wall and they just don't know how to handle it. Well, you know, what I see are these parents who, what I call, I call the absolute parents They, you know, it's my rules or the highway and they kind of do everything for their kid. Their kids never learn to make a decision because, um, you know, I liken it to, um, I would tell my parents, I'm going to swim practice. I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning. Nobody got me up. I had an alarm. I was expect, I knew that if I didn't show up, my coach was going to make me do extra push ups the next time he did see me. And I didn't want to get yelled at. I, I, and I wanted to excel and I actually enjoyed being there. So I'd get up, I'd ride my bicycle to the, to the pool before school. I would do my, you know, do my workout. And then I'd ride back home and I pack my own lunch and I go off, get my backpack and off I'd go to school. I had to be accountable for myself. And it started really early, you know, and, and I will say um, when I have seen kids who have absolute rules like your curfew is 10 o'clock and I don't care if the movie goes till 10, 15. And you've told me where you are and who you're with. My rule is this rule and that's the way it is. When you create those absolutes like that, you're not allowing them to make good decisions on their own. You're micromanaging every decision they make. And so when it comes time to go to college, they've never had to be accountable to themselves and they're out of control. It's like, woohoo, party time. And it might be nothing more dangerous than staying up all night and gaming, but they won't be on a team very long and they won't be in school very long. And so they have to kind of learn these things and it's safer to learn them before you're spending thousands of dollars at a college. Yep. You are, you just totally told my personal story. Mom was, you're going to college. I don't care which one. And if you don't, you're out, you can't live with us. It was just like, you're going to college. That is non-negotiable. And so I end up at this college, having been under the thumb, having had no decision-making power. And then, yeah, I went wild and didn't, didn't have any, I didn't have any volition. I didn't have this drive, even though I knew I wanted to be a sports psychologist. I wanted to work with kids. Mm -hmm. Like I was so clear, but I showed up there and just was like, party. And then next thing you know, I fail out and I'm just totally floundering. Yep. And it's called EQ, emotional intelligence. And if I had had, you know, those conversations about, you know, why is it important and what, what would you like to pursue and why would that, you know, there wasn't any of that Mm -hmm. for me. And I think that could have been really helpful. Well, I hear parents who go, well, I wrote my kid's college essay and I'm like, are you kidding me? (laughs) And you, what are you teaching them? Yeah. One, there's a ethics issue, but it's like, I mean, are you going to write their college papers too? Probably because they probably wrote their high school papers. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, what what is the ideal parenting strategy that you've seen? You know, what maybe a case study of a, a parent who just did it right, who did it totally right. Well, none of us do it totally right. I'll just tell <laughs> Shoot, you. Shoot, I'm hoping for that. I'm like, give me the, okay. give me the. End. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I made my fair share of mistakes, and I quote, know how to do this, right? Yep. I've got, I know how humans learn, right? But we all get in the heat of the moment, and we're like, just get in the car, and we throw their bag in, or whatever, or you know, like, work swinging through McDonald's. I know you're supposed to have vegetables. That's not good parenting, but sometimes you, circumstances happen. Yeah. There are no perfect families. There are no par- perfect parents. There's no perfect child. What you're aiming for is happy, healthy, and resilient. Mm. That's what matters. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't have those, they're not going to be happy, healthy adults. And that's our job. That's, that's really it. Our job is not to get them doing gymnastics at the collegiate level. Our job is not to get them on the Olympics. If you have a kid that's, that's, that is that driven and it's got to be on their own, yeah. you're in their back pocket and doing it all for them, that's not developing grit and tenacity. That's your grit and tenacity, and you're pretty much what I call bull whooping a kid into doing their sport. There's no joy in it, mm-hmm. and it ends up just being a battle. Um, I always tell this, the, the funny story um, when my eldest who played um, lacrosse at the collegiate level before he was injured and went, you know what? I think I really want to be a pilot. I'm not going to ruin my body anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> lacrosse is a pretty brutal sport. So when he was about three, three and a half, his dad had told him to go take a timeout in his bed, to go sit on his bed. And, you know, that was what you were to do not play with your toys, not, you know, not, not look out the window, whatever. So I pretty soon I look back and he's put his, he's put him on the bed. I don't know what he had done, but it must've been egregious. And cause he was angry. His dad was angry and he was like, pulls the door to, and the kid opens the door and he goes, you know, you're being defiant now get on your bed, blah, blah, blah. So then it becomes a tug of war with the door. And I look back there and I said, who is punishing whom? What's the consequence? There's no consequence. Your only consequence was to put him on the bed. He gets up from that. He's struggling with the door. Now you've created a bigger battle. So there was no, no discussion. The kid had no voice. So when they become powerless, what do they do? They rebel. You see it in a three-year-old. You see, you see it whenever we scoop up our kids and go, okay, we're not doing this. And you just break them away from whatever it is they're doing, good, bad, or ugly. And so we create these power struggles and it's our ego. So when you remove your ego as much as possible, it creates that opportunity for decision-making by them, learning coping strategies, learning uh, conversation strategies. And so the more you can create opportunities for them to fail safely, the more likely you are to create tenacity and resilience in that child. Yeah, which will get them through their sport through high school and into and through college, yeah. ideally. And and I, I always tell these parents, I like, I I know there's a psychology that says at certain age, girls quit everything and a certain age, boys quit everything. I get that. So, but when you have a kid who's giving you all kinds of signs that they really don't want to compete at that level, that they're only doing it for you <laughs> or for your, your expectations, you've created a problem that's your ego. And that is one of the hardest things as a parent is to let them have autonomy and create competency without us creating these walls and barriers for them. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes me think of a, you know, a couple of athletes who I've known who gymnasts specifically who have had these big heartbreaks. You know, they are mm-hmm. on track. They're the right age. They're the right level. They're the right gym. They're the everything's kind of right. Mm-hmm. But they 
but they're not, you know, they're not winning nationals. They're not, mm-hmm. they're just a little bit below where they need to be to get into that number one school choice. Mm-hmm. Then they talk to maybe somebody like you, or they talk to somebody who, who kind of gives them a reality check that's, yes, you have done everything right. Yes, you have busted your butt for the last 12 years. Yes, you have. But that might not be the best school for you. And they, it's like the heartbreak runs so deep that they just fall out of love with their sport. Okay. I have a process that I take my students through. And the first thing I do is I actually go, what do you want to study? What do you want to be? Because you're one injury away from not playing your sport again. Hmm. So if you don't have your sport, let's just take that out of the picture first. What are you passionate about? What do you think you want to do? What are some things that you excel at? What brings you joy? Now, a lot of kids don't know what brings them joy. It blows my mind. They go, well, my mom says. I'm like, no. They say, well, my sport is all I do. So that must be it. And so I'm like, "Mm, do you go to school to play your sport or do you go to sport? Do you go to your sport to go to school? So I always tell them, look, let's pretend you blow out your ACL, MCL, and, you know, and you tear your meniscus all at the same time. God forbid that happens. I don't want it to happen. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But let's pretend that happens. And they go, oh, it's never going to happen to me. Okay, but let's pretend. We're, we're playing a pretend game. And they're like, okay. What would you want to study and what would you want to do with your life? Because one day your sport will end. All of us, it ends for all of us. And then, and then I, I have a girl who right now wants to study engineering. And I went, great. Let's find a great engineering school that also has your sport. And let's look at what they're looking for in players. And so my kids aren't just creating a short list of schools. We're talking a significant list that they apply to. And so there's a whole process that by the time they've got schools that I call a reach that either for athletic reasons, academic reasons, or both, there might be a stretch for them because they haven't done the nationals or whatever. And then we have the the one that's a really good fit. And we'll have two or three of those. And then we'll have some that I call shoe wins that they could get in. They could play their sport there. And, you know, there's a highly high likelihood that they're actually overqualified for the school. And then we start, going to the school and we start talking to those coaches and then we get when the rubber meets the road is when I go so is that coach recruiting you and what does that look like because if that coach isn't recruiting you then why are you wasting your time unless you're there for the academics and that's another conversation if you want to go there and study engineering and not play your sport that's great that's awesome Let's find the best way to get you in there and leverage your sport and leverage your your skill set to get you into a pile of money that you will qualify for to apply to to get scholarships. And so it's, it's a complete process. And what ends up happening is I'll have some kids who go when they find out the realities of what it takes to compete at the division one collegiate level for certain teams in their sport. And they find out, let's say they want to study nursing and they find out that they can't take any laboratory courses in season and they can't take any laboratory courses out of season on Thursdays or Fridays or after noon, after 12, any day of the week. They're like, wait a minute, that's not why I'm going to college. And it's, it's very interesting to see, the psychology of what happens. And some of them select not to play. Some select to go to division two, which is a full-time job, but it's a little bit of a different um, schedule of what is expected of you from the coach. Or they go to division three where sometimes they go there because that's the money they need. They're not going to get much because quite honestly, the average college scholarship in sports outside of the head count sports is about $8,000 and it's not guaranteed to renew. It's not guaranteed to be renewed because you're not getting a full scholarship from a school. You're getting a partial academic uh, athletic scholarship 
coaches split up their scholarships so they can acquire more assets for their teams. And so it then becomes a numbers game. And a lot of times the parents will go, Ooh, I thought they'd get a full scholarship. And I'll go, well, you might get a full scholarship, but it won't be based on sports. Mm. It might be a, a financial package. That's an interesting mix. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now, so a question that a a member of the perform happy community asked when I told, I told them I was going to talk to you. Mm -hmm. She said, she was asking about finances and she said, if a family finds it financially tough to pay for gym, travel, competitions, um, other things involved, uh, are you familiar with the NCAA rules around personal fundraising or things that are allowed in those situations (laughs) where the money just is, isn't quite there? Okay, are you talking about money to go to college on or money to keep stay in your sport at the high school level? Money to stay in their sport, I, it sounds like at the college level, different um, fundraising for, uh, let's see, donated goods, fundraising parties, GoFundMe, different things. NCAA is pretty strict. And if I were a parent, uh, if their child's already in a college, I would contact the compliance officer at the university and I would be very specific in my questions. The compliance officer can be your best friend. Okay. And now this one, she's younger. So she's just not even in college, not in college yet. No, I don't even think she's in high school yet. I would. Well, the rules change every year Mm. right now. That'd be a big no, no. Mm -hmm. Um, but it depends. It depends on the division you play at, too. Okay. So all so, just questions for compliance, things to keep track of. And now, when the rules and and, and their compliance rules are very clearly written. Yeah. Fortunately. Yeah. Okay. And then when 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 in the year are they finalized? When do the rules each year change? Do you know. Usually they come out in like June, July. So now they come out right in when schools are pretty much out of session, okay. when the sports teams are okay. So not that's competing. the time to check in. Yeah. And, and and I would check in their junior year of high school. Okay. And then just keep checking from then on. Okay. But I will tell you, that wouldn't be an issue if so if their student is playing college sports, um, if done correctly and re- and they go through the process. Um, they should know financially what they can afford. They should know their EFC. If the school writes off, so there's certain types of schools. So if you qualify for financial aid, um, well, it depends on what your combined family income is and whether you have other kids in college. And there, there's a big formula, but State schools are sometimes 100% of need met. Sometimes they're 80% of need met. So let's say that you apply and your EFC is X. And that's your estimated family contribution. So they say you can afford to give $8,000 a year for your kid to go to school. The school costs $38,000 a year. And that's lowballing. I mean, that's that's a very inexpensive state, in-state tuition at like Illinois. Okay. So let's say you're going to Urbana in, in Chicago. So then the school says, okay, your our tuition is 38,000. You've paid 8,000. And let's say you're not getting any other monies. It's just, that's just what you can afford to get. Then there's $30,000 deficit that needs to be met. Well, if they're hundred percent need met college, they will write it off. They essentially are giving you a $30,000 scholarship. They don't call it a scholarship because it's a needs-based grant. But if if they do, some colleges only meet 100% of need the freshman year. And then the rest of your years, it's like 80% of need met. Some schools don't. So it's understanding how they do this and whether they're a merit school a needs-based school, or a hybrid of the two. That's why I tell people it's sometimes your family will get more money if they go to a really nice, exclusive Division three school. 
get a, a name education, the level of competition may not be what you thought you would get, but your kid's getting a great education and you're not paying out the nose for it because state schools have very little money to give. Their money goes to need. Merit, merit money is very seldom or very frugally given at state, at state colleges. Private colleges have more money to give away for merit. So that's another reason why not to say my daughter will play basketball at UCLA, hell or high water. Well, let's put it this way. It's $68,000 a year to go to UCLA. 62 to 68, depending. So they don't, they don't give academic scholarships. They give some academic money, not a whole lot. But I don't have $60,000 to shovel out of my pocket every year for my kid to go to college. And they can get a great education elsewhere. And by the way, gymnastics, on average, how much money do gymnasts get? for a scholarship at a division one school, maybe eight to $10,000. That leaves you with a $50,000 a year tuition fee. Now you can take out loans, but why would you saddle your child with that kind of loan getting out of school? Because it gains interest while you're still in school before you even start paying, you're still amassing interest on that loan. And they're saddled with this huge student loan. And yeah, they've had a great experience at UCLA and they may or may not graduate from there. And you've got, how much did you just pay for that mom and dad sweatshirt you wanted from UCLA? (laughs) Is it really worth, you know, $200,000? I don't, I think, I think that is one of the most irresponsible things a parent can do is to saddle their kid with that kind of debt. So it sounds like the best thing that you can do as a parent of a junior high or or young high school athlete is to just foster that open-mindedness and talk about what's the big picture and what do you want to study and who do you want to be? And then Mm -hmm. what brings them joy in their life? Mm -hmm. What are the things that they're passionate about? And if they're not passionate, at least they're very invested in. Yeah, the things they want to do, not the things they feel they need to do. Yeah, so when you were growing up, did you know a kid who we we would now call him a feral child? And I'm going to tell you, I was a feral child. My mother tried for me not to be, but I am the the quintessential kid who was totally defiant. I mean, I was stubborn. I'm still stubborn today as well. But a feral child is the one who's always outside, always dirty, building ramps to run their bike over or... They're, you know, they're, they're taking logs and building a hut on the beach or they're, they're the kid that was kind of the free spirit who wrote sock puppet plays and put on, you know, puppet plays for the neighborhood and their mother didn't care. Their mother didn't run around and say, well, you know, to pick this up and you need to be at, you know, you need to be at, at uh, dance class and cotillion and da, 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 da. Their mom just kind of let them free range. What they were actually doing, whether they meant to or not. This kid was learning how to fail. This kid was learning how to be on his own, how to entertain themselves, how to develop their own passions and interests independent of their family. And they were getting some lifelong learning experiences that served them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so to those those parents out there, it's just... Just let go. (laughs) Well, if you don't, if you're a helicopter parent, be prepared to keep doing it when they're in their 20s, their 30s, and 40s. I didn't want my kids living in my basement playing video games because they failed to launch. Mm -hmm. So if you don't embrace beginning to let go of some things that are not that important, we just get caught up in the moment. But if we let go of our ego and let things happen more organically in our children's lives and let them control some of the decisions with input and guidance where you say, okay, I see this. This is a great idea. These are some consequences. Did you think of this? Did you think of that? This can happen. Tell me what some consequences you think could come out of this. Let them invest in the 
in the experience. And when you do that, you'll create a kid who has more to offer. Because frankly, I don't want to be parenting my 20, 30, and 40-year-old. I'm hoping that at that point, it's okay to start shifting from parent to more of a friend. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be friends with a (laughs) 15-year-old. I don't want to be friends with a (laughs) three-year-old. No, because you'll be parenting them at 30 if you let them be your friend at three. Or the boss, like they really want to be. Oh, yeah. Well, my daughter used to be called Bossy Flossy, the bossy little moo cow for a reason. (laughs) We got to come up with a good catchy nickname for this one. (laughs) Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like the, the best thing parents can do is let go, let their kids fail, ask them good questions, allow them to be involved in the decision-making process, help help them uncover who's in there, who's that joyful person who who isn't just making people happy, isn't trying mm-hmm. to be perfect, but who's in there. Mm-hmm. And allow them to just blossom in whatever direction they want to go in, even if that means not their number one school choice mm-hmm. or or things that parents maybe don't want to hear which is a risk that you have to take when you allow that openness in a relationship with your child, I think. Yeah. But it sounds like one worth making. It, it, it really is because, you know, we, the most important job in the world, honestly, is parenting. And it's the one we're least trained and prepared for. And then once we figure it out, we're grandparents, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I watch my grandchildren and I have two little granddaughters and I look at their mother and I'm going, God, I wish I'd known that when I was your age. Mm. And then I go, well, maybe I did and just kind of ignored it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, And we're just all doing the best we can. (laughs) Absolutely. And like I said, there are no perfect families. There are no perfect children. There's no perfect parent. And is there a perfect school for each kid? Actually, I think there is. Okay. I think there's a really good fit for the kids that doesn't make the parents bankrupt. Okay. And if they want more information on getting in touch with you to help them find their perfect school, how do they do that? Okay. They can go on my website, um, thescholarcoach.com, and they can sign up for my newsletter or they can email me, shannon at thescholarcoach.com. Fabulous. And I'm happy to, you can get on my calendar. We can talk for 15 to 20 minutes and see if what I do is a good fit for them or if they're a good fit for me, I I'm all about fit because what works for your child is most what's most important. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. I have learned so much myself and I know a lot of parents out there have probably taken some good nuggets from our talk and I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you so much. This was great fun and it was a pleasure meeting you. So anybody who wants to reach out, feel free to get a hold of Shannon at scholarcoach.com or Shannon at thescholarcoach.com. And we'll be back next week with more good nuggets to help you raise happy, healthy, successful, and resilient athletes.